Have you ever run Psalm 23 in reverse? And ask what happens when the Lord is not your shepherd? This is how it reads. The Lord is not my shepherd. I lack everything. I have no green pastures in which to lie. No quiet waters. My soul is never refreshed. I have no clue about the right path to take in life. When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear every possible evil, for I'm utterly alone and have no comfort. My enemies are many. My cup is empty. Goodness and love do not follow me all the days of my life. And I have no promise and no assurance that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's quite confronting, isn't it? And yet that is how the majority of people live. Around 40% of Australians now claim no religion, but the percentage of those who live without the Lord as their shepherd would easily be closer to 80% and probably more. Some of you have heard me uh, say this before, that Susan and I, a few years back, had a couple of days uh, farm stay in New Zealand, uh, working on quad bikes and with dogs gathering um, and herding 3,000 sheep. Not that I was making a useful contribution, mind you, but uh, 3,000 sheep or more, bringing them in for pregnancy testing by ultrasound, every one of them. I didn't know their names. They didn't have names. But in the ancient world, in the first century, there was one shepherd for every 30 to 40 sheep. And the shepherd cared for each of their sheep individually. The sheep had names. Each morning after they'd been cared for overnight by hired hands, along with other sheep belonging to other shepherds, the shepherd would come and just call his sheep. And his sheep and only his sheep, who knew his particular voice, would respond and follow, them out to, follow him out to pasture for the day. As long as the sheep followed the shepherd, went where he went, did what he did, followed his voice, responded to his commands, then the sheep had it very good, very good. Pasture, water, resting place, protection from thieves and wild animals, defence from enemies, care if injured or wounded, search party when lost. It was good. When they followed the shepherd, there was nothing they needed. Friends, that is what it's like for you and me. If we follow our shepherd, the Lord Jesus, our great shepherd, when we follow his voice, when we heed his voice and hear his voice and obey his commands and live how he wants, then there is nothing we want. But for those who want nothing to do with him, who claim their independence from him, then the exact opposite is their reality. What do you think is the greatest need in the world today? Or we could have um, a very long list, couldn't we? If you were asked to fill in a survey, what would you say? Uh, Post-COVID economic recovery, uh, an answer to the threat of foot and mouth. I know that looms very large for many of us. Uh, inflation, rising inflation rates, uh, climate change and its threat in terms of floods and fires and rising sea levels. <clears throat> World peace at threat, perhaps, perhaps like we've not seen uh, in the last 100 years. All massive issues, huge concerns for today. But there is a greater need, a way greater need. Jesus tells us in Matthew 9.36, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Like sheep without a shepherd. Harassed and helpless. That is as if they'd been attacked by a, a wolf or a bear or a lion, bruised and battered, in need, no one to look after them. That's what people are like who have no shepherd. Many are, are damaged from sin and are helpless. Many feel like that they've been torn apart. Many live in fear and despair and not knowing why. They have no comfort in the present and no hope for the future. Jesus sees this. He sees people for the position that they're actually in in reality, for who they are, and he sees them as sheep without a, uh, 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 without a shepherd, and he feels compassion. Compassion. It's an unusual and remarkable word in the New Testament. It comes originally from the guts. Of, it's a churning, and it's only used of Jesus or by Jesus. Isn't that fascinating? A, a special word reserved 
to talk about him or that he uses, to indicate that he's deeply disturbed in his guts with love and pity. It's the same compassion that led him to step out of heaven and into our world. You know, we walk down our streets and uh, in our towns, the people going about their day, doing the best they can for their families, making provision for their future, farming their land as best as possible, putting food on their table. But friends, if they do not know the Lord Jesus, they are missing something vital. Hope and perspective and assurance and confidence and security and identity and a future. Do you believe that they're missing out if they don't know Jesus? Do you believe that they've missed the very point of life? Do you believe that they're missing forgiveness? Do you believe that they are in in eternal danger if they do not know Jesus? Do you see those you walk by as harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd? Do you feel any of Jesus' compassion for such people? Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And he says, pray for more people, not paid professionals, but just more people who will show people where they can see the shepherd. If their need was that they were sheep without a shepherd and he asks to pray for more workers, he means people who can point them to the shepherd. There's the shepherd. That's where you'll find everything that you need. I want to ask you, do you think a priority for your local church is to share Jesus with others who don't currently know him. Just does Jesus' compassion for sheep without a shepherd motivate your church into action? Does the desire to share Jesus more effectively cause you to question the value of this church activity or that church activity? Does Jesus' compassion for the lost get your creativity going so that with a sense of excitement and urgency, you're working out how you can possibly reach others with the saving news of Jesus. Our diocese has been ministering across one third of the sides of New South Wales for over now 150 years. And without a doubt, there has been some great ministry through that time. I honour those who have proclaimed the gospel and taught the Bible and reached the lost over the history of our diocese, who have made enormous sacrifices, who gave their lives without reserve for the work of the gospel, who came from the eastern seaboard or sometimes from the UK and rode horseback to take the gospel to remote communities and hold services under trees and teach Sunday school with kids gathered and sharing meals with those who would open their hearts and homes to them who served as dedicated lay people or ordained clergy with little or no thanks or acknowledgement and not much support, little human reward, and often, sometimes at least, seeing little fruit from their labours. If you're among us, I don't expect that there's anyone 150 here today, but (laughs) if you're among us and have served long and hard in the coal faces of our parishes, who have laboured on either with clergy or without clergy, who have never given up, who have tried new things, run activities, fundraised, or if you've been supporting the work through diocesan boards and committees through many trials and challenges, hear me say today, thank you. Thank you so much for your perseverance, for not giving up, for keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus, for hoping for a better church one day. What we're not saying in launching a plan for the future is that there's been nothing good that's happened in the past. It's only because that there was something good in the past that we still have any churches still going today. But by any measurement, we do find ourselves in a dire position. With some exceptions, hear me say with some exceptions, our churches are tiny. Our congregations are aged. We're not seeing new people come in the door or come to Christ. We have very little across the board by way of youth or children's ministry. Many of our churches have not one Bible study group. 16 out of 28 parishes have no clergy. And of those 16, around half have so few people that They can't afford clergy. Our diocesan survey, which we undertook some weeks back, suggested that few of us pray or read our Bibles during the week. 
Many in the survey commented that they've never been invited into somebody else's home. The survey suggested that many of us have never invited anyone to church or to anything connected with church. On the whole, with some exceptions, he, he, he may keep saying that, we're just not making an impact for Jesus. Why are we in this position? Some might say, well, Mark, you know, you're, you're new to this game. That's just life in country towns. <laughs> but I got on the phone during the week. Our friends at Narrabri, comparable town to many of ours, just over 7,000 people. You know how many people in the Anglican church there Sunday by Sunday? 150 to 160. Youth group of 20. Glen Innes, again, a town not, not, like, not unlike some of ours. 6,200 people live in Glen Innes. Around 80 to 90 in church each Sunday. 12 to 20 kids in Sunday school. It's not just church and country towns. Why are we in this position? Because all our time and energy of the last few years corporately as a diocese has been sacked by the CBA court case and redress? Yes, undoubtedly. All of that was very costly to ministry in so many tragic ways. Why are we in this position? Because we've been content to keep doing church as it's always been done. And in some places, not just content to do church as has always been done, but stubbornly insistent that church be done always the same way as it's been done. And I'm not just talking about Sunday services. Please don't hear me that. I'm talking about our whole approach to church life. How do I know? Because in places where church has started to be done differently, slightly more relaxed services, more intentional activities around Bible studies and evangelism, play groups, I can show you life and change and growth. Now, Brian Glenn Innes, as I mentioned, but in our own diocese as well, in Millthorpe, in the new service at the cathedral, the monthly evening service at uh, Ralston, ministry in Forbes and Parks and Dubbo, where there is a more relaxed feel in the services, more contemporary music, more focus on Bible teaching, a regular Bible studies offered, often offered, uh, more intentional children's ministry, play groups, youth groups, and one-on-one -on -one discipleship, a Jesus Explained or an Alpha course or something, and you start to see the difference. Sharing Jesus for life is about sharing so that people know Jesus. It's about Jesus, making Jesus the centre of our lives, our church, our preaching, our activities, our Bible studies, our, everything that we do. And it's about life so that people come to life, but also that we are passionate and equipped and ready to share Jesus for the term of our natural life. And these are my hopes and my prayer, my longing for our churches, that we become a missional church that is lovingly connected to their community and effectively sharing Jesus. That we become a Jesus-centred church where Jesus is worshipped in spirit and truth and the Bible clearly taught. That we become a discipling church producing lifelong disciples of Jesus who are trained and equipped for ministry. Now, some of you might want to push back on me at that. Insulted? Are you suggesting, Mark, that our churches are not like this now? And the answer is, on the whole, it is true. They're not like this. And I think our survey showed that you think this as well. Our survey showed a lot of sadness, a lot of frustration, about church which is disconnected with their community, unwelcoming to people and making no impact on their communities. Brothers and sisters, we are at a crossroads. 
Unless we do something different to that which we have been doing, then I would predict that our current 28 parishes, by the time we get to 2030, will be half that many at 14. Why do I say that? Well, all you have to do is to see the average attendance and the average age of those attending, and then you realise that the reality is that most of those people currently attending, by the time we get to 2030, will be with the Lord. That's quite a shock, isn't it? I know some of you are aware of this because you've said the same thing to me. And you might say to me, well, Mark, hang on, you know, what can we do, Mark? We have no minister. We have no resources to do anything differently. We wouldn't know where to start. And that's the beauty of this plan. Let me just take one scenario. No minister and you have 16 people in church at the moment. What could you possibly do? Well, in the plan are a couple of ideas. And what we're asking and suggesting in the plan is that you just take two, three ideas back to say, we can do that. So, for example, church of 16 people, no minister. Here's one idea. Occasional non-threatening social events for inviting friends. A lot of you are very good at putting on a great afternoon tea. Just run one in somebody's home and say, getting a few friends together, just come. Or from the Jesus column. Foster dependence upon Jesus by a commitment to regular corporate prayer that underpins and upholds all church programs and ministries. What if you're 16 people if you advertised a prayer time and maybe five will come? That's five people gathering for prayer that aren't currently gathering for prayer. That's doing something. That's a strategic plan. If that's the only thing you do for the next six months, that will be fantastic. Or from the life column. All church members encouraged to join a Bible study group. Well, at, at a church of 16, you could be the Bible study group in someone's house, watch my sermon or somebody's sermon, lead a discussion. If I knew you wanted to do that every week, I would write discussions for you every week. Now, none of those things require a minister or extra resources, just a passion for making the tiniest of difference. And I guarantee that if you do those three things, your church life will start to change. And that will mean that you will want to do more. And you'll get back out the plan. What's that plan? We want to do more now. This is going well. This is going well. What else can we do? The sharing column speaks about reaching sheep without a shepherd. The Jesus column, making sure we know and love and are passionate about and worship and live for Jesus, the good shepherd. And the life column, practical steps to train and equip us to be workers in the field which are ripe for harvest, to train us for a lifetime of service. In the seminars that will follow, and we're just doing it in smaller groups so that there's more time for the interaction and discussion. Three seminars offered three times and you, your dots will tell you, Tim will tell you about that in a minute. Kevin and Andrew and Beck will make clear that no church is expected to go to work and tick off every point there. Oh, that's a relief, isn't it? In fact, that would be impossible. The plan is designed just to give you ideas, to plant some thoughts, to spark some vision. It's designed to show you how to begin making the tiniest of difference. It's designed so that you can pick out points which might be helpful and relevant and significant in your context and then you'll see that page two is blank so that you can bring the ideas from the page one onto page two and say, well, this is what we are going to commit to work to. Take this back to your church. Take it back to your parish council. Uh, have a parish planning day in a few weeks' time. We'll support you. We will send one of our team members to your strategic planning day and help you work out what might be possible at your church and what might make the tiniest of differences. But remember the big picture. Remember what I've asked you to consider. Sheep without a shepherd whose everyday reality is the frightening prospect of Psalm 23 
in reverse. And then recall Jesus' compassion. And then as you begin to feel Jesus' compassion, take some small steps forward so that you and your church are about the work of sharing Jesus for life. Amen.